Okay, so this lecture is the Accessibility Research Lecture and the purpose of this lecture is that I want to give you an insight into kind of what research with uh, on accessibility topics looks like, where can you find it, what sort of stuff is out there. Um, and I also want to give you some idea of what sort of stuff we're currently working on in Dundee and then the challenges that we face doing that. So doing accessibility research has a particular set of challenges and that's typically due to the participants that you're working with. So they will have various often complex disabilities and so it's important that we take them into account somehow when we're designing our research and then when we're implementing that research. Uh, so I want to touch a little bit on that and we'll link that back to the Belmont report in this idea of you know, respect for participants etc. So First of all, where are you going to find this sort of material? So you're going to find material on accessible computing with SIG Access. So this is a special interest group on accessible computing. It works in a similar way to SIG CHI that we've discussed before, uh, but in this, this is um, almost a subset of that group. So it's people who are interested in design, development, evaluation and scientific investigations of technologies to support individuals with disabilities. So that is a very broad description and that professional, that might be a researcher, it might be someone who works for a company. You find that within SIGCHI there is a lot of input from big companies. Uh, so Microsoft, Google, Apple, um, IBM, all of these companies have representation within them to look at accessibility, both within the implementation and the design of their software and within the, their own business themselves, so they have employees with disabilities, etc. So those people uh, are part of the SIG Access Group, and some of them have quite prominent roles in the, the running of uh, the SIG and the associated conferences and workshops that go along with it. So the mission statement is that they will support the international community of researchers and professionals, so that's that distinction, applying computing and information technologies to empower individuals with disabilities and older adults. So tag that older adults, we'll discuss that in a second. The SIG also promotes the professional interests of student and computing personnel with disabilities and strives to educate the public to support careers for people with disabilities. So that's another element about employees with disabilities and careers for people with disabilities. So all of these things are things that people within the SIG will be discussing. Uh, so that thing about older adults, I want to go back to that. So older adults, if you think of older adults, they typically have some sort of impairment due to age related decline. So that might be uh, older adults tend to get um, vision impairments, they tend to have uh, an increased need for glasses, or which would be an assistive technology in this case. Uh, sometimes they can have more prominent cataracts. You can also get changes in colour perception for older adults. So those things are, you know, in a sense, similar to people who have uh, visual impairments from birth, people who have colour vision deficiencies and so on. Obviously, there's a, there's a distinction there in that someone who has that from birth or for a very young age has a different life experience than someone who acquires that as an older adult. And the one that you see most, I would say, caught the most challenging is hearing. So someone who has had no hearing or little hearing from a young age or that it has deteriorated within a shorter space of time when they're younger, they tend to have more coping strategies than an older adult who spent their entire life being able to hear, often quite well. And then suddenly that hearing is such that they're missing out on conversations. It's causing some kind of like social exclusion. So their experience is obviously that they've never been a part of the deaf community. And so they have to now go and access information that might not be directly applicable to them. So that's the reason that the work is kind of both disabilities and older adults with the idea that you can include both of these groups together and design solutions but with the underlying life experience often being very different. 
So the main conference for SIG Access is the Assets Conference. That kind of flips between the USA and Europe. So this year it's going to be in Athens. Uh, last year it was in Pittsburgh in the US. The year before that it was in Galway in Ireland. So you, there, it, it's quite a global conference. So they attendees tend to be, um, I would say the majority are American, uh, but they do travel to Europe. And all, because it's in Europe, you get a lot more European representation in those years. Uh, so it's a small conference, there's about 200, 250 people. And it's a young conference um, by a lot of kind of group standards. For accessibility conferences, it's actually quite an old one. Uh, so it first took place in 1994. And it kind of has evolved over the years to broaden that um, mission statement and broaden the kind of concept of what accessibility is. Uh, so it's typically academics that come along, but as I say, there are some industry people and some of them, Sherry Truen from IBM, for example, are very prominent both within the SIG and within ACM as a whole. And often we get people arrive from government of local areas. So when it travels to different places, you tend to get uh, local policymakers coming along to learn what is uh, current. So every year they give an Outstanding Contribution Award. Uh, so the Outstanding Contribution Award is something you should definitely go and look up uh, because the people that have won this award are usually like epic individuals. Uh, so it's awarded to someone who's made a significant and lasting contribution, so they tend to be older, uh, to the development of technologies that improve accessibility of media and services to people with disabilities. So the nice thing about that is that there tends to be some kind of tangible application to what these people have developed or worked on over time. Uh, so if you take uh, the example of 2018, so it's awarded every two years, this award. So the 2018 version went to Judy Brewer. And Judy Brewer is the director of the Web Accessibility Initiative at the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C. They are the people who write the WCAG guidelines. So she has been involved from early stages, if not the beginning, in creating an organisation, the Web Accessibility Initiative, that can actually go out there and start to promote guidance, promote accessibility needs to people within government, because it's leading into the law, right? It's leading into the access the Equality Act in the UK, Section 508 in the US. And these things are not something that happened over time. You know, Judy was pushing at the door for a long time before anyone would accept that this was required. Anyone would accept the business case that this was required and so on. Previous winners, Professor Richard Ladner, who's the guy on the right side of that photograph, he's from the University of Washington. And Professor Vicky Hansen, who now works for, um, I think, IBM. She worked for Rochester Institute of Technology, and I think she was at the University of Dundee in 2014 when she won. Uh, so Vicky used to run the side lab in Dundee. So it was about um, empowering people to be included in society, even when they were digitally excluded. So rural people, people who live in rural areas, older adults, that sort of stuff. So I would highly recommend you go and find, you know, one or two of these individuals that have won the contribution award and just <clears throat> have a look at the sort of stuff that they're doing. I think it's pretty cool. Some of it might seem like common sense now, but think back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, how common sense it would have been then. Well, it's not right. So they've stuck it out a long time to get to the contribution award. This is, I hate these things, I don't even know why it's here, but this is a word cloud of, I know why it's here, it's from the ACM website. It's a word cloud of all the title and tags of papers that have been submitted in the history of assets. So you can see that there are, you know, assistive technology, accessibility technology are all very common. What's interesting is you can start to see some kind of, um, you know, topics that have been popular, some of them have kind of come and gone. Uh, so touchscreens had this big spike of interest 
um, with the development of PDAs. Uh, so really back then, not even just iPads, back at PDAs. Um, empirical studies are increasing. They're quite difficult to do um, for reasons that we'll discuss at the end. Uh, there's a lot of confounding factors with disabilities. Auditory feedback, so things like uh, voiceover, speech readers are all providing auditory feedback. So that gives you some kind of keywords that if you want to go and find out what they are, then it might be a fun afternoon. Okay, so some examples of what we do at the University of Dundee. So accessibility research at the University of Dundee is myself currently, Mike Crabb, Anna Lou Waller, and uh, people that are spread across uh, our labs. So overall, we want to focus on understanding how people with disabilities use technology. So that's the first stage. We need to understand what strategies someone has to overcome their disability. And th because those strategies are A, developed in response to a technology, and B, a natural mapping of how technology should work. So if we can understand those, and we can empathise with people who use disabilities, then we can start to do part two, which is making use of this understanding and empathising that we have to develop new tools or provide new opportunities for people with disabilities. And by that, I mean, like, can we develop something that will help someone with disabilities achieve a particular task? Will it reduce the load that they have, be it a physical load using an existing system? Uh, would it allow them to have new opportunities in employment or new opportunities within the community that they might not have had before? But this word empathising. So empathising is an interesting word because often empathising can be a very transient thing. We can find someone who is in a situation and say, well, we empathise with your situation. However, Blah, blah. So this is something that's being discussed quite a lot in the community at the moment is the use of this word empathising. And you can empathise with someone emotionally or you can empathise with someone by being with them. And this being with someone is the important part. So you can see someone who has a disability and you have, you know, someone's in a wheelchair and you can empathise with that person because you broke your leg and you were in a wheelchair for a few weeks. But only by being with that person and understanding, OK, they have A, way more strategies than you ever had in two weeks to overcome things or challenges that they faced being in a wheelchair. They have a whole lifetime of dealing with people while being in a wheelchair. And so by being with that person and really speaking to them, you can then begin a true deep empathising rather than a superficial empathising that we often see kind of in society. So uh, Cynthia Bennett is a particularly outspoken person. She's an academic who is kind of advocating for people to really understand the impact that a disability has rather than think that you understand the impact a disability has. So that's what we do. We want to understand stage one, understand how people with disabilities use things. And then once we have that understanding, we can then develop new things. So one of the projects that I've worked on is Bright Lights. So this was work that was done by uh, David Flatler, uh, Gareth Tigwell, who is a PhD student who's now at RIT. David's now at the University of Guelph and myself and also an honour student. Kerr McPherson from a few years ago, he made the, the app that we've used as the trial for this. So a situational impairment is a challenge that you face as a result of your environment. Uh, so it's noisy, so I can't hear my phone ring. A situational visual impairment or an SVI is when that challenge related to vision specifically. So you might have situational hearing impairment, situational visual, etc. So these pictures show someone using a screen when it's dark, so there's screen glare, it hurts your eyes a little bit because your eyes aren't adjusted to the bright light, and someone trying to use it in the sun, so you're having to shield uh, the screen with your hand, 
use your body to shield it, for example. So that's a situational visual impairment. So it's related to whether or not we can see things. So coupled with this, when we want to see things on a screen, there are minimum guidelines between what the foreground and background must be in terms of colour contrast. And they come from the web consortium accessibility guidelines. So in order for us to see clearly uh, between the foreground and background, it's got to be four and a half to one for normal size text. Uh, but these guidelines, they were developed a long time ago, so 1999, so 20 years plus, but they didn't at that time take into account mobile usage. They were created on a screen, something like in that image there, a set distance from the screen with the screen at a set height in a room with a set lighting. So it was a very specific set of conditions that means that those uh, colour contrasts are applicable within only that environment. But we know from situational visual impairments that there are problems because sometimes you might see something perfectly well, but then when you go outside, you can't see that same thing that you just looked at. So what we want to do is gather a lot of information about colour contrast in real life environments. So we came up with a game, Bright Lights, and you can go and see the paper uh, just at this link down the bottom to go and get some more information on that if you want to. But the idea is that we can gather information about how people see things. So you have a, a box, that box is moving along, or rather the screen is moving behind it. And you can see that the screen, if you go to the right, then down and right, becomes progressively darker. So by the time you get to box three, it's becoming quite difficult. If you're just sitting with a laptop in a room without direct sunlight, you can probably see it. But I would predict that if you take that to the window and try and look at it in the sun, you're not going to be able to see that difference or it's going to be much harder for you to see that difference. By the time you get oh, to box four, you, know, you can't really see it. It's much harder. So what you would do at that point is you would press this uh, light bulb down the bottom and you get three light bulbs in a game. So the idea is that you want to encourage people to really go until they can't see the difference anymore. <clears throat> but when I press that, I can gather information from the phone data about the orientation you're holding the phone, your location. I can make an estimation as to whether you're indoors or outdoors. I can tell you what your screen brightness is. I can tell you what the ambient light is. Um, I can predict whether or not you're moving, whether you're playing the game with an additional cognitive load of walking along the street versus just sitting in a chair. And I can use all of that to model data to make new rules about colour contrast. So this is what we're working on at the moment. We're trying to, we tested this game using just specific um, like guide uh, setting. So we had three conditions, which were basically three uh, different lighting conditions. And obviously it models what we already know. So, well, not obviously, but thankfully it models what we already know. So we know that people who are looking at brighter light and people who are looking with lower light are going to view things differently. So that, that maps well. So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to create an app that will allow us to gather all of this real life data. So we've got to start on that. We can then use that data to model uh, the world and we can use that model to affect change in an interface so that the interface can actually change color depending on where you are. So that if you go outside, it can switch to a high contrast mode. When the lighting goes above a certain level, we know that that's problematic for people and a high contrast mode will be initiated. It might uh, remove certain colours. So if colours are too close to each other, that would cause problems uh, for... Well, when you have colour, you have colour on certain axes and it's hard for you to see the colour on those axes. So we can take them away and put different colours in place, which make them a higher contrast for you to be able to see. The most obvious high contrast is black and white, but we want to avoid that if we can. But the, the colour 
a lot of David's previous work on color models and color replacement is going to be very interesting, kind of on the scale of websites and things, how we can uh, change those colors over. So first stage is pure high contrast, black and white, and then we can start to expand. So that is bright lights. So, and like, if you're interested in research, this is an example of someone using their honors project to then progress. Like obviously Kerr went into industry and that was fine, but he's the author on the paper because the work on that paper came from his honors project. So if you're interested in research, bear that in mind, speak to a supervisor about it at the start, because that makes a change as to how the project progresses, right? Okay, that's one example of what we do. The next example of what we do is understanding emoji usage. And this is a project between myself, uh, Gareth again, and Ben Gorman, who's at the University of Bournemouth as an academic down there. And what we are interested in is emoji and how people with visual disabilities interpret and use emoji. So emoji are a set of Unicode characters, and there's a lot of them, right? There's more than 3,000. And they have some visual representation of things like objects, expressions, and emotions. So generally, people use them to clarify message content. So you've got a thumbs up or whatever. Adding fun or humour, so you can use emoji, a string of emoji to kind of make a sentence or you can use emoji to represent your emotion when you send it to someone and that's a bit more entertaining than just trying to describe it. There's also the subtext of social communication where what you send in a message isn't actually maybe what's true, so you have this kind of sarcasm or joking going on. There's often a lot of in-jokes, so groups of people might have an emoji that they use for a specific situation. Um, and that, unless you understand the context of how that emoji came to be, then that can be uh, limiting for people just in general social interaction. And you can also use them to reply quickly to a message. So you can send a love heart, I love this, you can send a thumbs up, I like this, that sort of thing. If anyone uses Teams, this is something that, that happens a lot. There's these like a quick response icons and people like stuff. So how does it work? Each emoji has a Unicode character and description that's called in a common local data repository, which is an XML format within your operating system. And but this means that there are differences across different platforms. So the representation that is given for different platforms is different. So sometimes very subtly. So that one on the right is the emoji with the description face with hand over mouth. And the left one is the Android version, and the right one is the iOS version. So the iOS version has these kind of red cheeks. And when you ask people, and slightly different eyes, so when you ask people to interpret that, more people will describe the right hand one with the cheeks as things like embarrassed or cute. Um, than they would to describe the left one. So particularly in Asian cultures, the blushing of the cheeks has some cultural significance. And so there are differences in how these are used. So even if you can see these things, there are problems, right? So users with visual impairments, what typically happens is rather than seeing the visual representation of something, they see that description. So face with hand over mouse. Uh, so this video here is just to give you a sense of how, I won't play it all, I'll just skip through different parts, but how does that sound? What does someone who is blind hear when they're trying to find something? So this is a video of someone just going through uh, within a messaging service, all the emojis that are available.
Okay, so what we can see there is that uh, the guy in the video there, he's scrolling through all of the different categories and then he's scrolling through all of the items within that categories. So we've got some issues with how to find things. It was a long search before he got to the calendar and you can hopefully see that at some points there are many emojis with a subtle difference. So there was the key in an old key, there was the open letterbox without a letter and then the open letterbox with a letter and then the closed letterbox and all of these things. I mean, the differences are subtle. So how does someone who has a visual impairment make sense of all of those different things? So we interviewed, first of all, we had a survey which gave us some sense of how people use emoji. So that was our understanding phase. And then we interviewed screen reader users about their experience of emoji. So when they receive them and how they use them. And we kind of came up with three categories. So emoji descriptions can hinder communication. Technology is both an enabler and a barrier. And the use of emoji impacts social interaction. So emoji descriptions can hinder communication just because of a lack of understanding of what it is that person's trying to tell me. So if someone's using an emoji and they can see that it is, you know, laughing face with crying eyes, what does a laughing face with crying eyes mean to someone who's blind? I can't see if that's a traumatic, a traumatic experience face or a happy experience face or whatever it is. So the descriptions are not always completely accurate. So sometimes, like if you imagine them in a text um, and you have a clock, is there an example? Yeah, so this right hand example from the rail company. It says, um, disruption expected until 1630, but that emoji is actually 1530. So then that kind of hinders that communication because it, it's, I'm sure, is disruption going to be finished by half past three or half past four? Then technology is both an enabler and a barrier. So it enables people to engage in communication, but how do I search and select? So you saw from the video that it's a long process. I have to remember things. People reported remembering like the position of items in a um, in a list. So, you know, it had the little number after each one. They reported that they would just use the ones that were kind of the most frequently used. But even if it wasn't the most appropriate, they would use that one because it was easier for them than going through the big list and trying to find it because Actually, I don't know what is there. I have to go through them all and find them. I can't just glance at a screen and pick the one that looks the most appropriate at that point. The output from technology can be confusing. Uh, so we have, yeah, so option B here, it says on the way to the plane landing plane for Kai. So those two emojis have a very, um, odd description in the context. Um, keeping technology up to date. So if something is uh, sent from a phone that has in uh, an emoji uh, released before another phone, that causes problems because there is no emoji to, to send. I need to keep my screen reader up to date so that it can deal with these new emojis as they become available. And I need to be knowledgeable about technology. So I need to know how to update my screen reader. I need to know what it means when it says emoji not recognized or emoji doesn't exist or whatever. How can I fix that? And the other thing that people had about knowledge of that technology is if you have a, something that has repeated um, characters, an emoji can say, rather than saying full stop, full stop, full stop, it will say three dots. It has names for set long characters, but if I just put like 12 exclamation marks, my I could set my screen reader up to say exclamation mark times 12, rather than exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, and so on. But that is within the settings menu. It's not at the top level. So people have to be confident and have enough knowledge to be able to go in and find things within the settings fix them if they get them wrong, find that setting again if they don't like what it does. So a lot of people just don't have 
the knowledge of all of these subtleties that their screen reader can give you. So if you don't have that setting turned on where it can reduce the character output, what you have is someone who has repeated emojis that it has to say over and over again. So it has to say, uh, crying, laughing face, crying, laughing face, crying, laughing face, crying, laughing face. And if you stuck those, emo those emojis in your like screen name, and now you're having a conversation, it'll say message from Rachel Menzies, crying, laughing face, crying, laughing face, crying, laughing face, crying, laughing face. And that is just annoying if you're having a, a long conversation with someone. So being able to have the knowledge to adapt that is important. And then the use of emoji is impacting on social interaction. So people use them poorly in context, like that half past three versus half past four example from before. People have uh, kind of disrupted conversational flows where I have to then maybe find out what that emoji is because I don't know, or I didn't understand and now we have to have a conversational repair so that myself and my communication partner are both talking about the same thing. And then there are cultural differences. So people who were blind talked about using emojis so that they could fit in with sighted culture. Um, when communicating with uh, deaf, uh, blind friends, sorry, so they would tend to use emoticons rather than emojis. So two completely unrelated things, but they're much more readily understood within the blind community than the visual representation of an emoji. So just some examples of problems that people have. So example A, someone has used emoji to create a picture. Uh, so you've got a whole bunch of issues here. You've got emoji within the screen name. That's going to read all them out. I just want to know that it's Emma. It's also E space, M space, M space, A. So I've got to spell it to myself now, which is annoying. Uh, they've put happy spring, but it's H, some kind of space, PPY, -P -P spring. And then they've used emojis in a certain order to create a visual representation. But if I'm just reading those out left to right, that makes no sense. So someone who has no sight or is unable to interpret that visually is going to miss the meaning of what that's about. The middle one is a conference, uh, a tweet from someone who's on their way to the CHI conference. And just here you can see an empty box that's for an emoji that doesn't exist on the recipient system. So Dr. Bloggs has tweeted that. He's probably tweeted like some new emoji that's just been released um, on Android, but I'm using an Apple phone and I don't have it yet. So I have no idea what that is. It might be important. That might be asking a specific group of people. Reply with a pineapple if you'll be there. Well, what is a pineapple in this context? The context is that conference is in Hawaii, but do I know that the conference is in Hawaii? I'm a bit unsure. And then this one here, this first one is actually like a caution emoji. So it's like caution, hashtag Waterloo, character I, this is some kind of speaker, GWR customers, lines reopened, then there's a question and an unknown thing. Train services are returning to normal and then so it takes me a long time until I get to train services are returning to normal and then I have the confusion about the time at the end. So too many emojis, inappropriate emojis being used. So maybe think about how you're using emoji over the next little while. Um, avoid repeated emoji. Make sure they make sense. So the way to do this is if you have like air, uh, is it air, no, not airplay, carplay. If you've got carplay or something similar like that, sit in the car for five minutes, just send in emojis to yourself and see what they, what they read out as. If you've got Siri, we'll read out your messages, turn that setting on, read out and see, and just get this sense of, okay, if I didn't ever look at this message, would I be able to respond and find what it is I'm looking for? So that's emoji. The last example is escape rooms. So I've been uh, interested in escape rooms for a little while. 
in terms of kind of the social dynamic that goes on within them. But then, like, I had an experience where I wasn't able to do something in a room because of my hearing impairment. And I was like, oh, actually, like, my hearing impairment isn't particularly serious. I have lots of ways around it. I don't declare it typically when I put myself on forms or whatever. I usually don't declare it as a disability. So if I have that impairment, what must people who have more severe disabilities be experiencing? And of course, there's an element that the room is designed to create situational impairments. It's designed to create confines for you. Uh, but it's just an experience that so far is kind of cut off for a lot of people with accessibility needs physical definitely because physical access to spaces is poor but also people who have sensory impairments so escape rooms themselves are live action team-based games where players discover clues solve puzzles and accomplish tasks in one or more rooms in order to accomplish a specific goal which is usually escaping from the room in a limited time so the fact that it's team based is important so uh, you might have people with uh, various impairments within the team uh, you're relying on some communication between the team uh, you're relying on being able to discover those clues yourself um, so in this case the one that i didn't get was that i did something at one side of the room and a latch unlocked which allowed us to push through a fake door and the designers were relying on us hearing that latch um, and everyone kind of like heard a noise but they didn't connect it to what they were doing uh, I pressed a button which should have been connected and I didn't hear the noise so we lost a lot of time in that room before someone kind of just leaned on the door and it opened and when we discussed it with the game master afterwards it turned out that it was me that had to press the button and I was confused because I'd pressed this button and the, no task had been accomplished, nothing had changed. There was no output to the thing that I'd done, so I kind of assumed that it was a confounding thing and abandoned it. Uh, the specific goal is usually escaping from the room, but often you must bring this thing with you. Usually there's a narrative that goes along in the room and it's usually on a limited time, so you have that additional time pressure that if you imagine an exam, and it's a 60 minute exam, someone with disabilities might get extra time, uh, but do they get extra time in an escape room? And well, there's a cost associated with that because an escape room is a business. They don't offer extra limit, extra time settings because they're on a timetable. Because if you take extra time, then there's dead time in that business before the next group will come in. So the way it typically works is you arrive, there's a briefing, you then go to the experience, which is the room, and then there's a debriefing discussion afterwards. So the briefing and debriefing is run by what is called the game master, and their job is to help you through that experience when you're in the room. So a lot of things go into creating an escape room, and this is why it's so difficult. So escape rooms are often people who have an idea, who have £10,000 in the bank, who go and make an escape room. And they're pulling in expertise from a lot of different places. So there's engineering expertise, there's the legality of health and safety and so on. So there was a tragic event in Poland uh, with electricity and uh, people lost their lives because the electric electrics weren't done properly. There's set design, there's logistics of how you move things around. How do you reset the room? You've got to have some narrative. You've got to have some kind of game design element. Um, you've got to maybe create software or like physical, tangible interfaces. And then there's some psychology on how do you redirect and misdirect people. So what we did was we had a survey and this was our kind of understanding phase. So how do you, what technologies exist in escape rooms and what accessibility issues are there in escape rooms? Question mark. So the analysis we used was an interesting analysis. So if anyone is doing the research methods stuff, at the same time, it's affinity diagramming. So it's a form of qualitative analysis. So we had from our survey responses, we gathered 289 affinity notes. And those are notes that researchers think says something that has a statement within it. And um, if it's just someone kind of like a flyaway comment, then it generally doesn't get included unless it's well, there's sometimes people give things that aren't relevant to your research questions. So you're trying to gather these notes with respect to those two questions that we have. 
We got some participants in who have expertise in qualitative research methods and escape rooms, and we had them start to create an affinity map of the responses and start labeling those groups that they've created. And then the researcher, which was myself, I did the other 50%. Uh, so we used 92% of the affinity notes in the final diagram, which was uh, pretty good actually. It's a nice high number, shows that the affinity notes that we created were relevant and useful. So this was the kind of four main groups that we had in response to those questions. So it was about a lack of accessibility, that there were situational challenges within it, the role of the game master was important, and the elements of immersion, the idea that you are within a narrative and you want to be immersed within that experience as you go through. So things like physical access to the room was a problem, but also things like single modality and how you communicate with the game master. That might be a walkie-talkie. Well, I, I find the walkie-talkie ones quite difficult. It might be just a screen that they're feeding information to you. So you have to be able to see that screen. Um, you're collaborating and relying on others. So do other people want to rely on someone who has a disability? Uh, do you feel that you're supporting that person or do you feel that that person's contributing to the group properly within that collaboration? Um, but also, if someone has a visual impairment, it's unlikely that the whole group will have a visual impairment. So there is a, a need to rely on other people within it. And then there's the business case. So as is the case, unfortunately, the business case isn't strong to include accessibility within these things because they're still making money without it. Uh, so some uh, business owners reported that they had some retrospective considerations. So one fitted out a group for people with a hearing impairment, but it was a one time case. It wasn't a, a prevalent thing across um, escape room designers or owners. Situational challenges play into it all the time. So there's environmental challenges that they are designed with like kind of maybe different textures of floors that might be difficult to walk on. There's background noise that's supposed to kind of simulate that you're in a bunker and there's bombs going off outside and or the zombies are coming and there'll be a soundtrack associated with that. You might have to have a physical uh, access issue where you have to crawl through like a, a split door so only the bottom half opens or you might have to do like target like a catapult type thing to knock something off a shelf and again that's relying on physical things and the biggest visual thing we had was colour so there is a lot of use of colour in escape rooms so count how many red green blue bottles there are well if you're red green colour blind I can't count red and green bottles because they all look the same and I don't know what one is red and what one is green so the use of colour is probably quite a simple one actually to overcome uh, but it relies on you knowing what it is the game master has to go and reset the room, so there's breakdown in that if it's not reset properly. So that can cause confusion, particularly when there's a disability and someone kind of assumes that it's their disability that's led to the breakdown. That can be quite um, challenging for people and cause a lot of anxiety. And then there's this communication thing again, which we've already mentioned. And then the use of immersion. So we use technology to typically to create an experience. Um, you don't want to be going into something that's like the Egyptians and Pharaoh and there is an iPad in the middle of the room. But if I'm going into something that's about fighting the zombies in the year 2040, there's probably going to be a lot of technology in there. So technology allows you to create this kind of sense of immersion and to give the element of surprise. And that element of surprise is what's crucial to the game design element of um, escape rooms. So kind of accessibility challenges that we discovered. So now that we understand that these exist, the next thing is that we want to go and create solutions. So examples are like if you have visual impairments, the use of paper materials, so there's no screen reader output, the use of color, lighting can be quite dim, so it's maybe hard to read things. Um, and that would be the case for a lot of these are situational for people who don't have disabilities. They can be <clears throat> situational or they can result in a minor, a kind of lesser disability, not a lesser, but a more minor disability becoming a bigger impairment 
because of the situation that you're in. A lot of things hearing wise, the feedback like the door opening, quite a few people mentioned that in the survey um, or Morse code. So a lot of the time information is presented in an auditory only format and you have to then kind of decipher the code and so on. Access around the room can be a physical problem, as is the need for fine motor control. So sometimes you have to kind of like connect two wires or uh, get something in a specific space. So that can cause issues for people who have motor control uh, challenges. And cognitively, like there's no map of progress, so you don't know when the end is coming. So for people who have things like autism, that can be quite hard. And there's no scaling of difficulty. So people who have learning difficulties difficulties may just find that the rooms are too difficult for them and that they can't process them in time. So someone who has processing impairment might not be able to take information from lots of different sources and come up with the solution. So that can be quite overwhelming uh, for people with cognitive issues. So what we want to do now is we are trying to explore in detail some of these specific visual impairments and then look at how we can create an adaptable room so that when I present myself to the game master at the beginning, I can fill out maybe an online form so that there's kind of that sense of personal identity not being eroded. But I can say I have a minor hearing impairment and I have a poor fine motor control and someone else in the group has this other problem. And so we can start to using technology we can start to automatically scale things or move things or if it's Morse code we can add a visual representation as well as the auditory one uh, so that we can start to explore uh, different ways of presenting the information in an ad hoc basis. Um, and the other thing that we also want to explore is what we're calling the superhero effect. So let's imagine you have someone who is blind Someone who's blind typically has a higher auditory processing than someone who is not. So if I had someone who was blind, someone said to me, oh, I'm blind, I could edit one of those puzzles, not to make it easier for the person who's blind, but I could speed up the audio of something so that that person who's blind becomes the superhero because they can interpret that puzzle faster than anyone else in the room. So they have turned their disability into an advantage within that room. So that's a very subtle kind of switch, but a very effective one, uh, particularly within like educational settings and so on. So which is where a lot of these games are used still. So that's what we're trying to do is create accessible escape rooms. Okay, last thing. The last thing is to discuss the challenges of accessibility research. Come on, there we go. So the participants themselves can be um, something that needs considered quite carefully. So are participants able to give informed consent? If they have a cognitive disability, how can we be sure that uh, the informed consent that they give is true and that they understand their rights and what they're agreeing to participate in? So the university has an enhanced consent process where we ask questions of the person to verify that they do in fact understand what it is they're being asked to do. Uh, they typically also come with support. So that is carers who come with them. Uh, so there's logistics involved in that. So when does the carer shift end? If that ends when they're in Dundee, but actually they live in Glasgow, then they're not going to be able to come to Dundee because the new carer can't take over. Uh, do they have additional needs? So do we need to make sure that there is um, a hoist in the bathroom? Do we need to make sure that there's a shower available? Do we need to make sure that they have a private space so that they can get changed? Do they need to make sure that they can, you know, drive right up to the building? And do they have needs for parking spaces and so on? So in this case, we're not just thinking about the participant, we're thinking about the whole uh, group that might come with the participants. So you might get a parent, a carer, a supporter, and are those parent, carer, supporters required in the uh, study? Or are you wanting to assess an independent effort? If that person's capable of independent effort, then how do you tell the carer that they're not needed or the parent, 
parents tend to want to be there and help. And that's about explaining that you're testing the the technology and not the, the person who's trying it out. Um, but also allowing some kind of input for the parent to actually give their opinion and that tends to kind of mitigate that problem. Physical access to the space is important um, and not just physical access but also things like noise levels. Uh, so if I have, let's say I've got the AAC group downstairs in the street area, they can be quite noisy um, because there's a lot of um, kind of generating noises to communicate, right, rather than just speaking to one another. So that can be noisy. You hear that right through the building when they're in. So I wouldn't bring someone who has quite a severe autism into the building on that day because the noise levels is likely to increase their anxiety and um, kind of sensory processing will go down and all that sort of stuff. So I'm thinking about the noise levels. I'm thinking about who else is in the environment. I'm thinking about how will they get into the environment? What state are they in when they leave my environment? So I have a duty of care to that participant, but I can't get that participant all worked up and anxious and stressed and then say, well, bye, go home. I've got to allow some kind of debriefing um, kind of thing. So that might be a sensory room. It might be a relaxation area to allow the person to kind of calm if necessary. Sometimes just being in a lab environment is enough to increase kind of affect in people. How do I get people there? Do I want to go to the person instead? Uh, but how does that impact on my study? Because if I'm doing a very strict lab study, then maybe I just have to deal with the expense of getting the participant to me. Participants might need to travel further. If I do a study where I need 50 participants, how likely is it that I'm going to get 50 participants with a hearing impairment able to independently travel to my lab? Probably not very because not everyone lives close enough to be able to travel. And where is the study if I go outside of the lab? So can someone do it with or without sport? Do I need to be there to you know, relieve any anxieties about the device? And how does that fit into my study protocol? And is there an additional cognitive load on that person? And is that dangerous? So if I'm giving someone um, a device to walk along the street, then that's a cognitive load while they're walking in what is potentially a dangerous environment. So how do I ensure someone's safety in that situation? So all of this, if we think back to the ethics lecture and the Belmont report and the idea of how we treat and protect our participants, you can come up with some very specific examples for people within an accessibility context. So you've got three kind of principles, respect for person, beneficence and justice. So respect for persons and protecting those with diminished responsibility. So a lot of our participants will have a diminished responsibility because they might be unable to give informed consent. And so we use an enhanced consent procedure. Uh, some of these participants will be unable to, um, they might be able to take part, but they might not fully understand that they can exit the study. And so we might have a supporter who will make that decision that if it becomes too much, they'll say enough's enough and we withdraw the person on their word. Uh, so there's lots of different ways that you can mitigate for that diminished responsibility, but it's all about making sure that that person is is as involved in the consent giving process and that we are sure that um, we're following the other principles as well. So protecting persons from harm by minimizing risks and maximizing benefits. That might be if someone has a physical disability, it, you might need to use rest periods uh, to mitigate the fact that they're going to be tired. Uh, so if you imagine Anilu, for example, uh, so Anilu has cerebral palsy, she finds it difficult to type for an extended period. If you recruited her for a typing study, you would need to give her longer rest between each kind of set of phrases than you would someone who doesn't have a disability just because the, the physical exhaustion of doing that is going to A, impact how she's using your system. So perhaps that's that could be a good or a bad thing, depending on your protocol. But it's also going to mean that she's exhausted for the rest of the day. 
So are you, you know, minimizing the risk to that person or not if you're sending them out exhausted after they've done your study? And the final one is the fair distribution of benefits and burden of research. So this is about who's benefiting, benefiting from the research and who's bearing the burden. So this testing accessibility with disabilities. If I am testing whether or not something is accessible, I need to be clear why I'm testing for that accessibility and that I'm using the appropriate disabilities to test. If I can use modeling or sampling in some way to reduce the amount of people that I'm using, then that reduces the burden of research on that group. Um, there's also the benefit side of things. So who will benefit from that? If I'm just testing, I've got a new system for the university and it is uh, an admin system. Do I bring in 50 people with disabilities to test that system? No, I bring in 50 people to test that system with a representation of disabilities that exist in my population group. Because otherwise my population group isn't bearing any burden of the research. My average admin assistant isn't taking part. So it's poor design process in the first place, but that burden falls unduly on the participants with disabilities. Okay, so that is kind of a, an overview of the sorts of things that we're interested in. And hopefully you can see, well, hopefully it's raised a lot of questions actually, that you have questions about, oh, but what about this situation and how would that impact, you know, the creation of what software, how would that impact whatever it is you're thinking about? If you've got questions, give me a shout. Um, I'd be interested to hear them. Um, and if you're interested in that sort of research, like if something I've said has resonated with you, then check out the UX Lab uh, website just there. So ux-d.co.uk slash student-projects. And that is a preview of the types of projects that we offer in the lab. So that's supervised by myself and Mike. And they're going to be on the list for honours and MSc projects soon. So that's just a bit of a preview for you of the sorts of thing that uh, we are kind of pushing, the sort of thing that we're working on. Some of them are related to the topics I've just discussed. Some of them are kind of would be brand new for you. So have a look if you've got questions about the projects I've discussed or the projects on offer, then just give me a shout.